Even as world powers attempt to negotiate a ceasefire between the warring factions on the ground in Syria and to initiate a political process to end the nearly five-year-old civil war and now regional proxy war, Russian and Turkish airstrikes continue to pound various targets in Syria. Just this week, the Turkish government has accused Russia of committing war crimes by deliberately striking hospitals in Syria, while Turkey's NATO allies have approached the country to ask that it halt strikes against Kurdish forces in Syria that are allied in the anti-Islamic uh, State coalition headed by the United States. Turkey and Russia plainly have important strategic interests in Syria, and these have collided into head-on confrontation between the two countries at least once in the last four months, when Turkey shot down a Russian warplane on November 24th of last year, allegedly in Turkish airspace, though the plane ultimately crashed in the Turkmen area of the Syrian province of Latakia. With all of this in mind, this is an extraordinarily timely panel to help us disentangle the competing strategic objectives of Turkey, Russia, and NATO in their engagements with the Syria crisis, and to better understand the high stakes potential for confrontation between Turkey and Russia over Syria and the attendant risks for NATO. We could hardly have a better qualified panel to address these thorny questions. Our first speaker, General Wesley Clark, needs no introduction as he is well known to UCLA audiences and indeed audiences across the country as the former Supreme Allied Commander Europe who led NATO forces to victory in Operation Allied Force against Serb forces during the Kosovo War. General Clark is also a widely published author of books and articles, including his recent op-ed in USA Today entitled, quote, In Syria, Russia is the Real Threat. Our second speaker is exceptionally well placed to explain the Turkish perspective on relations with Russia during the Syria crisis. Raif Gudrugezar currently serves as a Consul General of Turkey to Los Angeles. She was previously posted in 2007 to the Turkish Embassy in Damascus, and in 2009 she joined the Turkish Permanent Representation to the European Union before returning to the capital Ankara to serve as Chief of Cabinet of the Undersecretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 2010 until her appointment in Los Angeles in 2015. And last but certainly not least, our third speaker, Daniel Treisman, is Professor of Political Science and an expert on Russian politics. His latest book is Return, Russia's journey from Gorbachev to Medvedev. He is also a frequent contributor to Foreign Affairs magazine and other journals, offering opinion-shaping essays on Russian policy and politics, including articles like, quote, watching Putin in Moscow, what Russians think of the intervention in Ukraine. Each of our panelists will have about 15 minutes to give their opening presentation, which will be followed by a question and answer session, in which we will invite you to join the discussion with your questions. Ashley, thank you very much for that introduction. It's great to be here with you all at UCLA. I'm very honored to be with this panel with the Consul General. Very nice to have you with us. Also with a distinguished professor who knows much more about Russia than I can possibly begin to talk about. And so I'm anxious to hear what they say and to hear the audience respond. So I'm going to try to cut my remarks to less than 15 minutes and give more time back for the Q&As. So we're dealing with the this is the end of the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916. It's been a century. It's done pretty well. It's frayed. It's coming apart. We don't know what's going to replace it. Maybe the boundaries will hold. Maybe it will be changed. This is about the future of the Middle East. It's about the future of the European Union. It's also about the future of NATO. Everything is thrown into the pot right here, um, or I should say into the Rubik's Cube. I've seen these nine-year-old geniuses do a Rubik's Cube in less than 10 seconds. 1.75, I think, is the record. Um, this is uh, a work of many years to try to unravel this and understand it, and hopefully uh, it won't be many more millions of lives. But this is, this is the center of conflict today. We're talking about Turkey, Russia, Saudi Arabia, <laughs> Iran, Syria, the United States, the Kurds. We're talking about Islam. We're talking about migrants, NATO, and the European Union, just to name some of the issues that are caught up here. So where to begin with this? I think the place to begin for me is that um, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein opened the door to Iran to have a much more active role in the region. This wasn't the intended consequence, but it was the actual consequence. 
And this coincided with China's entry into the global <coughs> economic stage and a rise in the demand for commodities and especially oil, which poured money into the region. So you had um, Iran reaching to um, achieve its the aspirations of, of, of Persian imperialism laid out back in the 1950s and 60s by the Shah of Iran. You had the Saudis uh, basking in, in oil revenues along with the Emiratis and the other states in the Gulf uh, who suddenly were wealthy. And you had at the same time uh, the injection of instability into the region. The United States was an early actor in this because when we didn't find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, we um, played the democracy card. It's a card that's hard for Democrats to resist, and so when it's played by Republicans, it, it's, it's, like, um, it's like super glue or something because you can't say no to it if you're a Democrat. You're going to bring democracy? You're going to have elections? You're going to have human rights? We're going to do this in this region? It's so wonderful. Can't we do more of it? And so we were behind the election of Hamas in the West Bank. Uh, people were warned not to do this, but, but we pushed it anyway. Turns out the most democratic country in the region in terms of participation seems to be Iran. Hardly a friend, but, but this was one of the many contradictions of policy. So we have money, we have instability, we have Iran's imperial ambitions, and then we have an amazing circumstance, which is the Arab Spring. And with it, countries saw opportunity. They saw an opportunity to check and stop Iran. At the same time, what I've seen is the emergence of Turkey as a modern power. So with, um, and again, this is sort of like, <coughs> I hate to say this, it's like going to heaven talking about flood stories and having Noah judging you. I've got the <laughs> Turkish Consul General, you've lived through this, but I've watched Prime Minister Erdogan and President Erdogan on the stage now for 10 years. I know how effective he is, I know the tremendous respect he has in the region, and he saw an opening also. He saw Turkey's wealth grow, especially after 2008, 2009, with uh, the Turkey as a sort of second level brick in the investment stage and Turkish, Turkey growing six to eight percent per year economically, Istanbul becoming really the capital of the region. Uh, and uh, so that added one more push. And in 2011, it sort of came to a head when as a result of Bashar Assad's mismanagement of the economy and his failed efforts at land reform and a drought and 600,000 farmers being dispossessed of their land and unable to survive, there was tender for violence. And what happened in Egypt, what happened in Tunisia, what happened in Libya, people could see the end of Assad. And with it, a way to choke off Iran and Hezbollah as they moved into the region. And uh, so there were many opportunities to do this and various groups were anxious to compete for the resources, the weapons, the prestige that came with the fighting. I've met with some of them. One man who's a, sort of a friend is a professor at the University of Arkansas, but he was born in Syria, and uh, he's part of the moderate Syrian resistance. Um, the United States sponsored it. The Saudis sponsored it. The Qataris sponsored it. I'm sure Turkey sponsored some of these groups too. They're all known to each other on the ground by rumor or by personal acquaintance, but they're not known to us. And, uh, and at the bottom, a lot of the foot soldiers are somewhat interchangeable and move between group to group based on resources, pay, and so forth. But it turned out that Bashar Assad wasn't easy to overthrow. And even when he used chemical weapons and we said we, he couldn't, we didn't act and time passed, and the fissures hardened, and the resistance, in any resistance movement, violent, the more violent element always takes charge the longer the resistance continues, because violence and fear are the ultimate coin 
of resistance and revolutionary movements. And Russia saw an opening. They saw an opening because first they tried it diplomatically when, when they helped us get rid of the chemical weapons or most of the chemical weapons in Syria. They saw it in the problems in Ukraine when the United States and Germany encouraged the Ukrainians not to contest Crimea, but to avoid provocation, just let it go. I made eight trips to Ukraine, uh, 2014, 2015, and so I got a lot of eyewitness feel for what this felt like from the other side. And Putin looked at it and he said, you know, I can play this smart. If I do this right, I've got the United States that needs me for the Iranian nuclear negotiations. Now, this is, Daniel, this is sort of my thesis on Putin. Uh, so he needs, the United States needs me for the Iranian nuclear negotiations. If I pull out, they're done, and Obama's going to have to bomb Iran, and he doesn't want to do that. Um, the Europeans need me because I'm the biggest market for their goods, and so even though they've sanctioned me in Ukraine, they really don't want to keep those sanctions on. They want to let those sanctions go. And so if I play this right, I can get into the Middle East, sell weapons, promote Russian technology, gain worldwide leadership again from my role in the Middle East, uh, have a, something then to trade off on the sanctions if I can do something constructive with migrants, and it, get rid of the sanctions in Ukraine and still have leverage over the United States. And so that's the basic equation that's playing out there. And from the United States perspective, it's very clear we don't want to be back in there with foot soldiers on the ground. Tried that once, didn't work too well. Turns out we don't really do well occupying Arab nations. And so the plan is to create an agreement, a consensus of the Saudis, the Iranians, the Turks, and all of the resistance fighters against ISIS and try to arrange at least some notion for the shape of the future Middle East, and then turn all that military power against ISIS and wipe it out. That's the sort of grand overall diplomatic conception. It's not articulated well because if you were a diplomat, you wouldn't articulate it either because it's pretty hard to reach it and you'll be constantly judged and measured a failure against it. But the way you beat ISIS, is by making an arrangement with Assad, keep his people in power, keep the structure of the state there, and somehow give him a ticket out of, out of time and get everybody to agree on the future shape of the region so you can get rid of ISIS. Until you do that, uh, and you may never be able to do that, you can't bring all that combat power to bear against ISIS. Now, I've overstayed my time here, and I'm going to halt right there and look forward to what everyone else has to say up here. Thank you. Um, well, um, actually, I'll just add upon to what uh, General Clark said, although I have certain points that we uh, slightly differ in. Now, um, let, since we're talking about uh, NATO, Turkey, and Syria, let me just give a brief introduction to our relations with NATO. Um, Turkey, in, uh, as some of you know, some of you don't, in 1952 became a member of the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It was for decades during the Cold War, the southern flank of NATO. Uh, Turkey uh, took and uh, continues to take part in several peacekeeping missions, including those in the Balkans, K4, S4, ISAF in Afghanistan, the uh, NATO training mission in Iraq, uh, and all around the world. So we are an active participant within NATO. Um, as regards to our stance towards Syria, I want to take it from a broader context and then focus on Syria since I have 15 minutes. I thought I had five, so I'm happy now. Um, so um, Turkey, um, in I don't like to call it the Arab Spring because I don't think it's truly a spring anymore, but when the Arab, let's say, awakening started, of course, in, it started in Tunisia and then uh, in Libya, Egypt, and then we're still seeing the civil war in Syria. Turkey, obviously, 
uh, supported uh, those countries' eventual transition to democracy, because as we all know, democracy doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's only in our strategic interest to have stable countries in our region, because we're the ones that suffer the most. Um, and um, as a part of that, Turkey also, um, in the beginning, I remember when the revolt happened in Syria, you know, before that we had good relations with Syria, and, the, and we advised the Syrians to directly go to elections uh, and <coughs> have an election, and if Assad wins, then he would continue. If not, then there would be a new government in. But um, Assad, instead of uh, going to elections, uh, transitioning to a parliamentarian democracy uh, chose uh, brutality. As the general said, he used and he continues to use all different kinds of weapon, weapons, barrel bombs, including chemical weapons towards his own people. So how we see it is that we see, the way we see it is that Assad has lost his legitimacy. It was true in the beginning, as uh, our general has said, we mo most of us thought, well, in Libya, Gaddafi was toppled down, in Egypt, Mubarak was to toppled down. So we all said, I remember then when I was serving for our uh, Deputy Secretary of State as his Chief of Staff, when we had meetings with our American colleagues, we were discussing that it was not a matter of weeks, it was a matter of days that Assad was gone. We're in our fifth year today now. So, um, of course, um, once we all saw as the international community that he was not going to leave easily, uh, the Friends of Syria group was formed. Turkey took part in the Friends of Syria meetings all around the world. Uh, we were a part of the Geneva processes, the first Geneva 1 and the Geneva 2 meetings where uh, Russia also took part. Uh, we had with Russia from the onset, bilateral, I took part in most of those meetings, uh, bilateral as well as multi uh, multilateral meetings. Uh, we met with them several times, conveyed our concerns, they conveyed their concerns. Um, but uh, when Russia in last September started uh, its airstrikes in, uh, in, in Syria, of course, uh, the whole, I think, uh, situation changed. Um, uh, uh, Professor Bali uh, touched upon the airstrikes, and it's. Uh, and uh, I want to mention that you know, in 2012, <coughs> Turkey uh, changed its uh, rules of uh, engagement. Uh, June 26, 2012. And uh, the change in the military engagement, the rules of military engagement concerning Syria were uh, conveyed to all of the parties as well as the United Nations. You know, letters were sent to the United Nations Security Council about this. So, uh, and we remain, uh, you know, it's the same thing for America regarding your borders with, for example, Mexico and Canada. You have all the right to protect your borders and all the right to defend yourself against any threats that are coming from the other side of the border. And that is what we have been doing. Uh, and our self-defense is our actually inherent right under international law, as we all know, and it's uh, reflected in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, the the uh, attack and the retaliation of our uh, military in the past days occurred because on Saturday last week, Turkey's border province of Kilis was shelled by the PYD YPG forces. And on Monday, our border security outpost in the Hatay area at the Syrian border was also attacked. Now, we have been a part of the Daesh, uh, global coalition against uh, Daesh, or ISIS as you call it, from the onset, uh, we have opened the Injunik Air Base. Uh, currently, there is the obviously American forces there, the forces of Britain, Qatar. Now the Saudis uh, are going to take part. We have German uh, uh, forces there, and uh, we are a part of the global coalition that is countering uh, ISIS. We have designated Daesh or ISIS in 2013 as a terrorist organization. 
Um, the way we see this is that unless a comprehensive political solution in Syria is not founded, these terrorists, it can be today, day ash, tomorrow it's going to be something else. It can be other, one group, they evolve into all, all different kinds of groups. We've seen this in, in, in Al-Qaeda, in Al-Nusra, and so on. A comprehensive political solution where the institutions within Syria are kept intact, but of course, Assad leaves. This can be through a political transition. Last, two weeks ago, I think time flies so fast and every day there is a development. So uh, there were uh, meetings uh, among the Syrians, the Assad regime and the Syrian factions that didn't go well. At the end of the day, the Russian permanent represent, uh, representative in uh, United Nations, he got up, he uh, blamed the Syrian opposition. Uh, then the French uh, permanent representative, he got up and he blamed the Russians for the, their intransigent uh, stance towards uh, the talks. So unfortunately, that didn't go anywhere. Then in Munich, uh, they reached an agreement to have a ceasefire. We'll see how everything's going to uh, unfold. Uh, of course, I want to be hopeful, but uh, as, uh, it's, as the general has said, it's very important to focus all of our efforts to fight, first, first of all, against terrorism. But I also want to emphasize here that there should be no selective approach to terrorism. We are in Turkey today, I don't know if you followed it, in our capital, again, a bomb exploded. Uh, until now, uh, I don't know, maybe my vice consul will correct me, uh, 28 people have died and there are over 61 injured. Uh, most of them are, are military men, are servicemen, uh, uh, but we don't know the exact information. So we are a country that has been suffering from terrorism over the decades, from PKK and DHKPG, KPC terrorism. These are the both uh, organizations that uh, America and the United, the European Union has designated as terrorist organizations. So uh, we believe that it's important if we are uh, addressing the issue of terrorism, uh, there should not be a selective approach. And we also see the uh, PYD and the YPG uh, in uh, Syria as a branch of the PKK. Uh, you know, uh, they have opened an office in Russia. And of course, after the, I, I must also mention uh, the, the downing of the Russian plane. And um, after, you know, in uh, November, uh, actually before <coughs> that, starting from September when they started the airstrikes, uh, we have informed our Russian colleagues on also on the military and on the political level about our rules of engagement and that we do not want our uh, airspace to be uh, violated. Uh, this was a discussion in several different meetings. Actually, more than 10 times we uh, politely informed them that uh, they should not be violating our airspace. But unfortunately, in November, uh, then it was not known uh, from which nationality the, the airplanes were, but two airplanes uh, intercepted our, uh, violated our airspace. We warned them uh, for a matter of, I think, five minutes or something. Uh, <coughs> yes, and, um, but uh, they turned around and came and then violated the airspace again, and one of them was shot down. It then later turned out that it was a Russian airplane. Immediately, of course, the Russian Ambassador in Ankara was called to the foreign ministry to explain the situation. That day, the NAC, NATO, NAC, North Atlantic Council meeting, there was an extraordinary North Atlantic Council meeting uh, because, you know, our airspace is also NATO airspace. Um, and um, our NATO allies, including the Secretary General of uh, NATO, uh, expressed their solidarity. And um, actually, uh, there was also another meeting in NATO, and I want to just read um, the, there's a Q&A with the Secretary General, and CNN asks a question to the Secretary General. He says, the Russians are saying the plane was shot down over Syrian territory and never went into Turkish territory. Are you convinced that it was shot down indeed over Turkish airspace, and that Turkish airspace was indeed violated? Violated, I forgot the D. Okay, Secretary General, the Allied assessments we have got from several allies during the day are consistent with the information we have been provided with from Turkey. So the information we have from the allies is consistent with what we have got from Turkey. 
Um, so indeed, it did fall in, uh, it was shot during, uh, uh, when it was in uh, Turkish airspace. Of course, we, from the beginning, tried to de-escalate the situation, but the Russians took it to a completely different level, and they have started a, a black propaganda against Turkey, where you see in the news, I don't know how closely you're following, every day they are accusing of, uh, us of doing something. And as a part of that, um, they have also uh, increased their support to PYD, the YPG. And the PYD has opened an office in Moscow where they have the, 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 the portrait of Abdullah Öcalan, was, which is the jailed PKK leader. And um, actually the PYD, YPG, and the PKK are under the same umbrella of the KCK, we call it. So we see them as also a terrorist organization. And that's why we don't discriminate. While we're also fighting against Daesh, ISIS, we are fighting against PKK, YPD, uh, PYD, and YPG. And we is expect our allies to acknowledge that and support us. I'm happy to, uh, I just read yesterday, I think, the, the spokesman for uh, the foreign ministry, uh, the, sec the State Department, we call it foreign ministry, sorry. Um, he actually made a statement saying that um, you know, the YPG moved into the Aziz Afrin region, which is actually bordering Turkey. And I have it in Turkish in front of me, so I'll quickly translate. He says that um, what the YPG forces have done in Aziz and Afrin are um, harming the region. And uh, we have um, called upon the YPG to uh, uh, refrain from any movements that will escalate the tension I'm a good translator. Uh, the tension between Turkey and uh, its Arab uh, allies. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that also uh, our American allies are recognizing that the PYD, YPG has its uh, own agenda and that they are not only there to help America fight against ISIS, but they're also uh, increasing their territory and so on. And you know, Amnesty International issued also a report about uh, PYD, YPG, uh, saying that you know they are uh, conducting ethnic cleansing against the Arabs and the Turkomans. So you know, it's 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 you know, I served in Syria for two years, ladies and gentlemen. At the end of the day, when I left Syria, the only thing I knew that I, was that I had no idea about the Middle East. <laughs> because it's very diffi uh, difficult, and I'm, uh, I'm from Turkey, so we are in the region. It's very difficult to comprehend what is going on. Because today, my, per my best ally in the region and my arch enemy, next day, we're best friends and then we're arch enemies. It's very, there, there, are, there is a system of co constant shifting alliances. It is very difficult to fully comprehend and uh, read what is going on. So the decisions that we must take as the international community <coughs> should be taken very wisely <laughs> and thought over. Um, I, I will leave it, I'm running out of time, so I will leave it at, at this point. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm uh, waiting for the, the questions to come. Thank you. Uh, Professor Treisman. Thank you. Well, it's also a great honor for me uh, to be on a panel with General Clark and Consul General Gazer. Uh, as a Russia specialist, I'm going to focus on the Russian role in these events, how Russia became involved <coughs> in Syria, uh, and also uh, how we ended up in this situation now uh, of a very potentially serious confrontation between Russia and Turkey. So you probably know many of the details. Uh, last uh, September, uh, as Consul General uh, Geyser said, uh, Putin sent his air force uh, in to support uh, President Assad of Syria and, and to uh, provide air cover for a new offensive uh, by the Syrian army and uh, various militias, including Hezbollah. So why did, why did Putin uh, send his air force in? It was quite an unexpected to many people at the time. I think the main reason uh, based on many conversations with people in Russia, is that uh, the Russians at that point thought there was a very serious danger that Damascus would fall uh, to the rebels, that Assad would be overthrown. Uh, from Putin's pers perspective, that would be a disaster. Uh, either ISIS uh, would end up 
in control, and that would be an incredible victory for the jihadis uh, and energize the jihadi movement worldwide. Or uh, US-backed rebels uh, would end up uh, winning uh, against Assad in Damascus, which could either lead to a stable pro-US regime in Damascus, uh, which Putin would, uh, would very much dislike, another case of US-backed regime change, or it could lead to complete chaos, as happened in Libya. So I think that was the main reason. They, they were seriously worried that Damascus could fall. I think there were some supplementary reasons, and in this I, I, I think I, I pretty much agree with, with uh, General Clark. Uh, Putin wanted to shift attention from Ukraine, uh, where he was lowering the temperature at that point in the hope of uh, getting the Europeans to weaken sanctions. Uh, and so he needed a new focus uh, for uh, the patriotic community within Russia, uh, a new uh, a set of stories for the nightly news. Uh, Syria uh, was a convenient one. Of course, that wasn't the main reason. I would say it's a, a background uh, reason. Also, at that time, the US and, and the whole West was trying to isolate Russia. And uh, Putin wanted to show that he was still an important player in international affairs. He also uh, had the chance to show off uh, the new military that uh, had emerged after several years of reforms. And as, as the general said, uh, perhaps to, uh, to, to advertise uh, some of the weapon systems uh, that Russia would like to sell. OK, so a number of, of supplementary reasons. But I think the key trigger was this fear that Assad uh, could fall. So the, the Russians began uh, uh, flying a, a large number of airstrikes uh, within Syria to support the, the new offensive. Uh, and then on 24th November, as was men mentioned, a Turkish F-16 combat aircraft uh, shot down a Russian Su-24, uh, which had flown briefly across a strip of Turkish territory. And at that point, Putin reacted with fury. Uh, he called this a stab in the back. Uh, he uh, accused Erdogan, uh, the Turkish uh, leadership, of being accomplices of the terrorists. And he slapped economic sanctions on Turkey. And as, as uh, Ms. Gezer said, he turned the propaganda machine, the, the quite powerful Russian propaganda machine, against Istanbul. So Russian TV. Uh, started airing reports. Uh, I saw, saw one of these reports uh, when I was in Russia shortly after that, in which uh, for about an hour or so, uh, the news program documented, so it, so it pretended, uh, the proof, which showed a lot of evidence uh, that Erdogan's family was personally uh, profiting uh, from sales of oil by ISIS, uh, which were sold into Turkey. And he, he said he would resign. He's still the president. So if there was any proof. <laughs> if there's a, uh, so yes, uh, uh, opinions about the, the quality of this proof differ. In any case, intense propaganda against Turkey. Now, this was uh, this, this furious reaction by Putin. This was a major turnaround. Uh, because previously Putin had been investing quite a lot in this relationship. Uh, the Russians had high hopes for it. Uh, Erdogan was, like Putin, uh, an outsider in uh, the international community, uh, the, the, somebody who the Europeans had snubbed. Uh, they didn't consider Turkey quite good enough to be an EU member. Uh, Putin could identify with that, that feeling of exclusion. And uh, that brought the two together. Uh, to some extent. Trade had been increasing between the two countries. About 20% of Russia's imports of fruits and vegetables came from Turkey. Uh, Turkish construction companies were doing a lot of development within Russia. Uh, and uh, three to four million Russians took vacations each year in Turkish resorts. Russia had agreed to build a $20 billion uh, nuclear power plant uh, in southern Turkey. And after the European Union sanctions uh, put an end to a plan to build what was called the South Stream uh, pipeline, gas pipeline uh, to Europe, uh, which would run through European countries, uh, Putin announced, after negotiations with, with Erdogan, a so-called Turkish Stream pipeline uh, 
uh, that would run underneath the Black Sea and through Turkey. So this was a, a relationship that the Russians uh, really hoped to develop, uh, but almost all of that has been either frozen or canceled uh, since the plane was shot down. So why this, this uh, vehement reaction? Why such a strong Russian reaction? On the one hand, it's not surprising that Russia and Turkey, uh, that there would be some tension between them uh, because uh, they had different interests uh, in Syria. Assad was a long time <coughs> ally of Russia. Uh, Erdogan, at the start of the uprising, as, as was mentioned, had decided to support the anti-Assad opposition. At the same time, there, there was the issue of the Kurds, uh, which uh, was and remains very troublesome. Turkey's greatest fear was that uh, a uh, Turkish, uh, sorry, a, a Kurdish uh, statelet would be formed on the other side of the Turkish border in Syria uh, uh, that would support the uh, PKK in Turkey and possibly demand unification uh, of the Syrian and the Turkish Kurdish territories. Uh, Russia, like the US, viewed the Kurdish militia in Syria as a useful partner. So objective uh, differences of interest, uh, but why the emotion? Well, one aspect might be, and I'm not going to pretend that I fully understand this, but one aspect might be that Putin and Erdogan uh, are just too similar to get along with. <laughs> uh, they're similar types of leaders who have forged uh, quite similar political regimes uh, in their countries. Both, although they came to power in relatively free elections, soon began concentrating power in their hands, removing any checks uh, on executive uh, control, uh, starting by getting control of the courts, the media, and so on. In the process, both of them alienated the more liberal, modern part of their societies. Both had the good luck to preside over a period of dramatic economic growth uh, and modernization in, in the mid-2000s, and that helped to make both of them very popular with the mass of the public. But since the recovery from the global financial crisis fizzled out, uh, both uh, have faced the reality that the growth rates of the past are not coming back. And both responded to that with increased censorship of the press and a turn to nationalism. Both Erdogan and Putin have ambitions to play an important role in international relations, uh, especially uh, of their regions. Uh, and another similarity, both, both lead countries that have strong linguistic and cultural ties to peoples living in other neighboring countries. Uh, in Russia's case, ethnic Russians living in the other former Soviet states. Uh, and uh, in Turkey's case, Turkic-speaking nationalities throughout the former Ottoman Empire. And I would say another, uh, another similarity recently is that uh, in, in, recent, uh, in the recent period, both have been gambling. Uh, that might be in part a consequence of concentration of power, uh, which means that decisions aren't vetted uh, very well. Uh, the leaders are, are not questioned enough by critical voices. I'd say Erdogan gambled successfully in, in calling a new election last November. Uh, his party won. Uh, it got back its majority in the parliament. Now, one, what, I, I, I would assume that he was gambling also in authorizing his, uh, his air force uh, to shoot down uh, what turned out to be the Russian military jet. I accept that, that they may not have realized it was a Russian military jet at the time, but they were certainly aware that Russian military jets were flying around there. That was a gamble, if, uh, given, given the situation. Now, Putin's gambles, I would say, consist of just about everything he's done internationally since Crimea. <laughs> uh, a whole series of steps uh, which had very large risks associated, uh, and uh, I would say not, uh, uh, not comparable benefits. And final similarity, both uh, leaders these days seem to be uh, it seemed to me, at least, to be prone to miscalculations. I would guess that Erdogan didn't anticipate such a strong reaction from Russia uh, to the shooting down of the jet. Uh, 
The Turkish Air Force had shot down a Syrian Air Force jet in similar circumstances in March 2014, uh, and, and that had been a minor crisis, uh, not this kind of major crisis. Uh, it's possible that they forgot that Russia was different uh, and would react uh, differently. So that was a miscalculation, I would say. Uh, I think Putin uh, underestimated the Western reaction to the Russian annexation of Crimea. Uh, it's hard to say, to, to be sure of that, but I think uh, the Russians were not ex expecting quite as much in the way of sanctions and isolation as, as occurred. Uh, okay, and, and perhaps the most alarming similarity, this is really the last one, uh, is that both leaders feel obliged for domestic political reasons to appear strong and not to back down under pressure. Uh, which means when two leaders like that are in a confrontation, uh, resolving it is harder. So finally, where do, where do things go from here? Well, the danger, it seems to me, is that if the Russian-backed Syrian army and uh, militia forces take Aleppo, which seems to be uh, their immediate goal, uh, and if the Kurds move for further along the border, uh, with Turkey north of Aleppo, then Erdogan is going to be tempted to intervene militarily. At the same time, I imagine, and I'm very interested to hear uh, General Clark's uh, thoughts on this, I imagine that NATO leaders are telling Erdogan, urging him strongly to exercise restraint, is the danger of getting into a conflict with uh, Russian forces uh, if Turkey sends ground forces into Syria is serious and this could lead to escalation uh, with the, uh, the NATO uh, membership of Turkey being invoked. Now, if the Assad forces take Aleppo, uh, the Russians may then press their side to observe the ceasefire. It could be that that would be enough. I think uh, uh, it's important for Putin to have a clear victory uh, to justify sending the troops into Syria, something that he can show to his domestic, uh, domestic public. Um, but uh, in recent days there's been some speculation, nothing more than that, but speculation that if uh, these forces take Aleppo, they would then uh, start to look east rather than further north. There's much further north they can go. And uh, that the Russians would start uh, fighting ISIS. Uh, a bit more seriously, uh, that they would uh, uh, even uh, try to threaten uh, the ISIS uh, heartland uh, in uh, the city of Raqqa. It seems, uh, of course, there is no way to know exactly what's in Putin's head, but rather than a confrontation with NATO, uh, which would be highly unpredictable, uh, he might be satisfied with just a uh, a, a visible success at this point, followed by uh, the ceasefire. Uh, but as I said, uh, I believe that for the last two years he's been gambling, and uh, when somebody's gambling and uh, believes that he's winning, it's very difficult to say uh, when and where exactly he'll stop. Mm -hmm. Our panelists have done a remarkable job of portraying just how volatile the situation is that the international community is now confronting in Syria with a real possibility of some kind of direct uh, confrontation between Russia and Turkey in light of their respective um, strategic interests and activities in, on the ground in Syria at the moment. I'm going to ask a variation of the same question, basically, to each of the panelists. I'll also give them an opportunity to respond, if they would like to, to one another's presentations and then um, open uh, the floor to your questions and give you an opportunity, please, to think about the questions you might like to ask because it's a valuable opportunity for you to engage as well. Um, General Clark, given your own history with NATO and your um, you know, deep knowledge of the way in which NATO conceives of its own, um, the, the alliance and the way the alliance connects to military strategy, how would you imagine that NATO might respond to the, the, the you know, if there were to be um, a deterioration, further deterioration of relations 
between Turkey and Russia along the lines that Professor Treisman just outlined, <coughs> um, whereby there could be the risk of an actual engagement between Turkish and Russian forces, or how might that be prevented um, by NATO intervention, um, political and diplomatic engagement. Uh, Consul General gives out, what kind of assistance do you believe that Turkey would expect from NATO in light of the kinds of scenario, again, that Professor Treisman outlined in which there could be a risk of Turkish forces being directly confronted in some way by Russian forces should they be present in Syria? And how are those conversations, to the extent that they're happening, evolving, whereby Turkey is discussing what self-defense might look like with its allies um, in the strategic alliance of NATO? And finally, um, Professor Treisman, if if we take seriously the scenario, I mean, at, at a minimum, I think um, many would agree that President Putin and President Erdogan share in common uh, an unlikelihood to back down under pressure, that they've shown themselves to be resilient against pressure time and again in different moments in their um, positions in their respective countries. In light of that, do you think that there is some other resource, at least on the Russian side, that does exercise some kind of a constraining influence? Or is it really, as you sort of suggested, a kind of concentration of executive power around President Putin on the Russian side with no checks in place to enable some kind of um, blunting of the brinksmanship that we see currently unfolding? So with, I would be so grateful if each of you would uh, take a shot at answering those questions and or responding to one another's uh, presentations, and then I'm going to open the floor. Well, okay, since you asked me first, I want to compliment both Consul General and Professor Treisman on great presentations. And, I mean, we could be up here for 10 hours going through this. And there's just no end to the depth of this. It's the most difficult problem that, that I've ever seen in diplomacy and war. Just a couple of thoughts uh, in response, Osley. First of all, obviously NATO doesn't want a confrontation between Turkey and Russia. Why? Because there are too many other equities involved. And the European members of NATO, of course, are struggling with the migrant issue. And it's here that Russia is actually the most vulnerable because um, the charge is that Russia's bombing is leading to an increase in the migrant flow or will lead to an increase, destabilizing uh, the EU. There's talk of the Schengen being suspended, at least for Greece. And um, I was in. Europe a couple of times over the last month, and uh, people are people don't see the future of the EU as um, as strongly as they once did. They see that it is uh, it's on very shaky ground. I don't. I've been around Europeans too long to think that it's anything's going to happen to the EU. But the fact that there's talk about something happening to it is is worrisome. But look at the agreement. Do we really think there's going to be a ceasefire? I mean. Who's going to monitor the ceasefire? Who's going to prevent people from shooting each other? Who's going to prevent one terrorist group from consolidating its gains at the expense of the other? Who's going to stop reinforcing and stop giving ammunition in? Who's going to prevent the barrel bombing from going on? There's no no-fly zone associated with the ceasefire. So it's unlikely to be anything more than uh, this is just this is the way these problems get resolved. When the diplomatic pressure gets too heavy on the various people, they always say, oh, let's do a ceasefire. And, but, but you haven't resolved the underlying problem of the distribution of power. Till that's resolved, this is coming back again and again and again. And just one further note on what happens. Uh, Daniel was saying that you know, we don't know what's going to happen after the ceasefire, and maybe Russia will go after ISIS, maybe. But it's also possible that Assad could use ISIS. ISIS is usable against Saudi Arabia, against Qatar, against other countries. And if it's kept under control, it's like it's having your own, like having your own hellhound there. Keep it on the leash, feed it a little bit, tell it what to do, and you promise uh, you won't choke it. And, uh, and ISIS is capable, and all of these groups are capable of operating that way. Just as the Consul General said, there are no permanent friends in this. Doesn't matter what the uh, sectarian divide is, they can all uh, use each other and fight against each other. So it's going to be a very interesting time going forward. Um, also, you asked whether uh, we think whether if there would be a direct confrontation between uh, Russia and Turkey on the Syrian border, how we think our NATO allies would 
respond to that. Well, uh, in after the downing of uh, the airplane, um, can you hear me, sir? Now? Is it better now? Yes. Okay, excellent. So, uh, to reply to your question, also, um, after the downing of the Russian plane, um, our NATO allies uh, made statements, including the United States uh, and the NATO Secretary General himself, saying that they are in solidarity with their NATO ally, Turkey. Um, but of course, you know, coming back to the professor's uh, presentation, now um, he said that. Turkey was uh, gambling, and maybe we couldn't really calculate the results of Russia. First of all, we've been living with Russia for over centuries. We know our neighbor very well. We know how our neighbor reacts uh, to certain circumstances. So it was definitely not a miscalculation. And we must interpret the, uh, the way Russia has been acting, starting from what happened in Georgia. And the fact that uh, Russia can continuously violate international law doesn't mean that they can continue to uh, violate other countries' airspaces and not have any impunity. Um, with, there was no reaction, well, immediate reaction to Georgia as regards to the annexation of Crimea. How do, you, how do you put this in the context of international law? I wonder what law professors teach to their students today about this case. Really, uh, and, and with what's going on in Syria again today, how much more will we tolerate Russia's behavior, intransigent behavior? Now, uh, on our side, that was definitely not a gamble. On the contrary, I think most people should salute us for our stance, for standing against Russia's behavior. Of course we know that we are a middle-sized country in our region, we're not a superpower. We are fully aware of that. Uh, we are a, a country that has, ha that has had a state uh, in a, uh, tradition for over centuries. We're not a banana republic. So we know our actions very, very well. And I also want to touch upon to uh, one uh, comparison uh, the professor made with, uh, with President Erdogan and President Putin. It's comparing, I don't even want to say apple and pears, I don't even know what to say. Uh, an apple and a watermelon or something. Maybe. So um, it is true that the relations were good because of course uh, uh, Russia is our neighbor. We have to, under normal circumstances, have good relations with all of our neighbors. Uh, it is in our strategic interest, as I said in the beginning, to have a stable region, to live in a stable region. But of course, when uh, one of your neighbor uh, openly violates uh, international law and your airspace, and you have warned that neighbor for uh, a long period before that, then you have to react against that. Because if we hadn't down that uh, airplane, what would have happened? Next. So we expect, as a part of the Euro-Atlantic Alliance, for our allies to support us, because we have supported our allies over the decades. We have gone to war with our allies. We have supported them in international fora. And it's, I think, only least of us to expect for them to support us. Ground forces, they've been speculating about ground forces. Turkey has no intention of sending ground forces to Syria. Uh, we know that if we send ground forces, that will only uh, complicate the problem. It is important to act with the international coalition to find, as I've said, a comprehensive political solution. Thank you. Professor Chisholm. Thanks. Well, Ashley, to, to try and answer your question, uh, are there constraining influences on Putin and his decision-making on international affairs? I think the scary answer is, pretty much no at this point. Uh, everything we know about how he makes decisions suggests that he does some consultation, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, but there's nobody who really outright questions what he does. Uh, one influence on him is, in fact, perhaps one of the most important influences on him is the information that is given to him. Uh, information is channeled to him uh, through uh, 
security service, the heads of the security services. Uh, and so the form in which the information comes to him can affect his decisions. But I would not call that a constraint on him, rather the opposite. Um, in the medium to longer run, I think public opinion could be a constraint on him. I think the Kremlin is quite sensitive to public opinion, but it feels that it controls public opinion at this point, uh, and that it's just a matter of better managing the media if there's a temporary fall <coughs> say, in, the, in the president's ratings. Now, if, his, if he were to do something internationally, uh, which would immediately prove extremely unpopular, I think that might affect uh, his behavior, um, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, so at, at this point, I would say there is very little in terms of constraints, and that's quite an alarming situation. Um, I'd like to just, uh, uh, building on some of the things that have been said, to, to, if I might, to, to pose a question to General Clark. Um, let, General, let's suppose that, uh, I, I understand that Turkey has no intention of sending ground troops into, into Syria at this point, but there has been some talk about uh, Turkey or the Saudis, uh, not uh, independently, but uh, as part of some kind of coalition uh, operation, sending uh, troops in, some, some number of commandos or even uh, several thousand forces. Suppose that were to happen, uh, and suppose they were to get into conflict with the pro-Assad forces uh, and uh, Russian planes uh, were to bomb uh, the Turkish or, or other forces, uh, and then Turkey were to respond with air defenses across the border, uh, shooting down some of the Russian planes, and then Russia were to bomb the Turkish air base, and uh, Turkey were then to invoke Article 5 and, and appeal uh, for support from NATO. My question is, what would happen? Yeah, it's a good question. And, I mean, of course, I mean, I'm going to tell you that um, if Turkey uh, is attacked, Article 5 will be invoked and NATO will respond. Now, that doesn't mean uh, thermonuclear war, but uh, there's a lot of intervening steps um, to get to where, you know, I mean, first of all, you know, the Saudis have been threatening for three days to put F-15s into Intralik. Um, last time I saw, there were four that might be coming to Inchilic, but I haven't actually mm, seen that they're there. Uh, and there's a big exercise going on in northern Saudi Arabia, King Khalid Military City. Uh, yes, but I've seen Saudi exercises before, and they're not like Russian exercises, let's put it that way. So it's not clear that they're, these troops are actually deployable. It's not clear what it means when the Saudis say they'll put ground troops in. They always say, as part of a U.S.-led coalition and so forth. So there's a lot of talk that's designed to bring leverage to bear to try to get a diplomatic settlement. The real card that, that the Saudis could play is the oil price. Now, this, the, the demand supply curve for, price curve for oil is 83%. If you under normal circumstances. If you take a million barrels of oil off the market each day, um, you're going to get an immediate spike in the price. And we've been about a million barrels surplus for, let's say, 18 months. So there's probably 500 million barrels out there. The, the world uses 94 million barrels a day. So that's only like five or six full days supply. If Russia and Saudi Arabia each cut a half million or a million barrels a day, you'd go through that surplus instantly, and the speculators would drive the price up to 60 or $70 in a week. Uh, the same way that it's been driven down irrationally, it would go back up irrationally. Russia needs that. Now, how badly do they need it? That's the question. So my friends in Russia, and Daniel, I'll ask you this. I'll throw this one back to you. Um, how bad is it? You know, there's a truck driver's strike against the, uh, the taxes. There's people out there. Uh, some of my Russian friends say that Putin's actually in danger, not from the established power structure, but just because in Russia things happen in an ugly, unanticipated way. They involve violence, and they could happen suddenly. So uh, there, there's that, that that could come out there. 
I want to just, um, I can't get through this without throwing the, this dirty word out on the table. Um, nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. We used to say in the 1970s and 80s that uh, the U.S. strategic nuclear deterrent was the ultimate arbiter in international affairs. In other words, when you run up against it, everything's going to stop. But a funny thing happened in the 1990s. We stopped investing in our nuclear deterrent, but Russia continued to invest. And Mr. Putin's been talking broadly and, uh, and rattling. It doesn't, all you have to do is say nuclear weapon, and you're accused of rattling nuclear weapons. But the truth is, he said it a few times. And the, at the unclassified level, uh, what, I, what I know, what I've heard is that, that uh, while we gave up on the neutron bomb, he didn't. And so he probably has some advanced nuclear weapons that are relatively more usable. They're artillery delivered. And when you come in terms of, of, of confrontation between Russia and NATO, it immediately goes to nuclear weapons. And um, that's why Daniel's question is so important, because the Russian military exercises um, for the last seven years have all used a concept called nuclear de-escalation. In other words, just to run out your scenario, and let's say there was no intervening diplomacy and nothing stopped this mad Russian, and suddenly Russia and NATO are in it. And uh, forces get mobilized, and, uh, and according to the Russian scenario, these NATO forces would attack. They see an attack coming from Poland into across Belarus to Russia. Moscow's under threat. You know, there's a one division 500 miles away that's crossed the Russian territory. They're just as jealous of their borders as Turkey is. And so their concept of the exercise is they would fire a nuclear weapon at Warsaw. Now, what would happen? At that point, the NATO nations would say, oh my God, nuclear weapons, okay, let's well, stop, stop, we didn't mean it. We apologize, they'd pull back, and that would be the end of the conflict, and uh, Russia's borders would be secure. There'd be no more Warsaw left, there'd be no more NATO, and there'd be no more West as we know it because of the recriminations and political consequences of this. But their exercises assume this. So what, that's why I want to just put this out here. You can't imagine this confrontation without going back and saying, well, what is our nuclear posture and what would we do? And is the Russian assumption right? And if it's not right, then how do we fix it and make sure they understand it's not right so they don't walk into a very dangerous situation in which we would respond? And the trouble with NATO-Russia confrontations is that they immediately go to uh, fear of the ultimate. And, um, and that's, that's why we want to head this one off early on. We don't want to get anywhere near this. So the idea is to use diplomacy to squeeze, to pressure, to push, to get leverage, and try to get these parties. The Saudis are trying to put together the terrorists who are the Sunni terrorists, the good, the good jihadis. So the good jihadis can represent a single negotiating point. The Turks have their own parties in there that will or won't join with the, but they'll be represented by the Turks at the negotiating table. And everybody will sit there and demand that Assad say he's going to leave, leave the institutions in place, and now let's get on with the fight against ISIS. That's the grand vision of this thing. And um, it's just a really difficult cake to mix and bake. It's really tough.